While it may look like an Iron Man repulsor, this cool device is actually at the heart of many of the manufacturing processes that make the modern world what it is. It's called the DC sputtering magnetron, or sometimes just a sputter coater. It allows you to coat almost anything in a thin layer of metal or ceramic, and so finds heavy use in the semiconductor manufacturing industry and many others. It's also used to make a variety of optical components from mirrors to filters and everything in between. It's frankly a piece of modern magic that I have wanted for years. Five years ago, I made my first attempt at this, and while it looked very pretty, I know all of the mistakes I made that prevented it from working. Over the years, I made several more attempts, but the issue was that I kept using whatever garbage I had around, and couldn't really machine things. But as you've probably noticed from the countless videos that have featured the metal lathe lately, that's changed. I've gotten much better at making custom parts, and I still had all of the pieces from those earlier attempts. So, last week as I sat in the lab, it dawned on me that I have the best toolset available to me that I've ever had, and five more years worth of experience. I could probably crack this in a couple of days if I tried. I knew which hurdles not to get stuck on, and what changes would need to be made for this to finally work. And as you saw in the intro, I was right, and the results speak for themselves. I can now readily coat glass in a pristine copper mirror that is very conductive. Today we're going to go through how I built this, how it works, and what things not to get stuck on. But know that this isn't the end. Thus far, I've only really gotten copper to work properly, and this is really just a prototype. There's a ton to cover already, so as I continue to make improvements and figure out how to get other materials to work, we'll come back to this. And like many of the videos lately, this is really just a tool that will hopefully be used in lots of future projects. At the end of the video, we're going to go through all the test results, and we'll talk a bit about what sorts of projects I'm already thinking of using this in. I built this not only so I could finally stop thinking about it, but also because it's an incredibly versatile tool that can do some really cool things. So let's get into it. The device consists of seven main pieces. The first is the chamber itself. This is where the magic happens and the plasma is made. Connected to it is the plumbing that handles the vacuum and gas inlet. To go with it is, of course, the requisite vacuum pump and gas cylinder. Below the chamber is a magnet assembly that concentrates the plasma into a tight, very hot ring, which we'll talk more about in a moment. To prevent the magnet getting too hot and losing its magnetism, the magnet is cooled by a water pump and ice water. And finally, there's the electrical system that makes it all work. We'll start with the chamber. I'm using a glass jar that I got from the dollar store. I chose one which is fairly small, so my pump has to do the least work to maintain the vacuum, and one which has reasonably thick walls as it's going to be under pressure and pretty warm, so it needs to take that abuse without cracking and imploding. Quick disclaimer, I only ever actually had that happen once years ago. I was using a jar that was far too big and too thin and had a small chip in a spot that was going to get hot. As soon as that area got hot, I heard the most nasty cracking noise and dove out of the way before it went off. It's an implosion, so most of it uses up its energy accelerating towards the middle, but then it just sprays glass everywhere, which is a nightmare to clean up. But since then, I've never had an issue. As long as you choose a smallish, thick wall jar and are careful with the drilling we'll do in a moment, you should be fine. I also chose this jar because it's got a wide mouth, so the already small working volume is easier to maneuver things in. The jar is going to be placed upside down on the metal plate, made of a material we want to coat something in. In theory, this could be almost anything, but as I said, this setup only seems to want to do copper easily, though I suspect it could probably do silver or gold. I had a small amount of success with steel, but only did one short test, so that's going to have to be revisited. I did manage to get a thin shadow of material during that test, but it's so thin that I can't tell if it's oxide or metal. But something happened. To make a seal between the jar and the plate, I bought a sheet of silicone gasket and cut one to fit the jar. To connect the jar to the plumbing, we're going to need to make a feed through for the jar. This is where I made my first error in many earlier attempts. I simply drilled a hole through the glass and epoxied in a hose barb to the top of the jar. While this may work in some cases, under vacuum most materials release small amounts of gas that prevent the pressure from dropping properly. Most epoxies are especially bad about this and outgas a lot. The only one I know that's kinda rated for vacuum stuff is Original Recipe JB Weld, but this time I wanted to eliminate as many uses of adhesives as physically possible from any part that will be exposed to vacuum. This way I have the best chance of success. I think this could still work using epoxy, and earlier versions did show some signs of success using JB Weld, but when you've got a metal lathe, it's just so much nicer to make a custom part and avoid cheap solutions so you don't need to chase down issues later. The part itself is very simple. It's basically just two pieces that thread together and have a hole going down the middle. The threaded part is much thinner to minimize how large of a hole I'd need to drill in the glass. To make them, I started with a piece of stainless steel in the lathe. I started with the threaded piece that's going to be on the inside of the chamber. I first drilled out the center, and then started reducing the diameter to the correct dimension to be threaded with an M7 die. 
Once it was to size, I used an M7 die to cut the threads. Many of you left a tip on an earlier video to use the drill chuck to hold the die flat at the start of the cut to make sure that the threads aren't wonky, and it worked really well. To finish up the part, I added a groove using my parting off tool, which is going to be used to hang the sample to be coated off of later. Then a file was used to break the edges, and the piece was parted off. The other half was made in much the same way. First a small hole was drilled for airflow, and then a larger hole was drilled to accept an M7 tap. To start the cut, I mounted the tap in my drill chuck, and would advance the tap and turn the head of my lathe manually to cut the threads. I switched to doing it by hand once they were started. For the rest of the part, I just reduced the diameter to fit 3 8 tubing, cleaned things up with a file and some sandpaper, and then parted off the excess material, and it was done. Once both halves were both cleaned and degreased, they were ready to be used, but we're going to first need to drill a hole in the glass of the chamber to fit them. Drilling glass isn't actually very hard to do, but there are some tricks to it. Primarily, things need to be kept cool. So to do this, I'm just going to be using a Dremel and assorted bits, and then the secret ingredient, which is modeling clay and some water. First, we make a barrier out of the modeling clay, which will retain the water. Make sure it's sealed well to the glass, otherwise it'll leak, which isn't fun. Then just pour in some water, and we're ready to drill. Just make sure to be wearing a respirator before doing so, so you don't breathe any of the glass dust. I like to start with a diamond burr, because they're great at getting the hole started. Once a divot is established, I switch to one of the conical abrasive bits. The trick is to take your time, and don't use too much pressure. Once you've drilled through, and the water inevitably drains, I switch to a cylindrical diamond bit, and just slowly widen out the hole. Remember to add more water regularly to keep this cold as you do so. Once the threaded piece can fit through the hole, you're done. Don't go much further than necessary. After that, clean the jar and we can mount the feed through. It's really simple. I just cut another small piece of gasket with a hole in the middle and sandwiched it between the outer glass and outer piece of the feed through. Screwing the two pieces together makes a tight seal as it compresses onto the gasket. Onto the plumbing. For now, I'm just using a hose coming off of the chamber that goes to a T where one end goes to my argon tank and the other end goes to my vacuum pump. Between the T and the argon tank, I've got a simple ball valve so I can shut off the gas flow and make sure no new gas is getting into the chamber. Eventually, I'm going to make another feed through and drill another hole so it's easier to feed gas directly into the chamber. This way, there'll be less connections in the plumbing, which could lead to sources of leaks. Also, I'll be adding a needle valve and gas flow meter so I can actually feed in small amounts of argon while things are running to help flush out contaminants. For my vacuum pump, I'm using an Edwards E2M1, as it's a two-stage rotary vein pump which can get to very low pressures. I tested it just to see, even though I kinda already knew the answer, but the cheapo one-stage pumps off Amazon cannot work and don't get even close to the right pressure. This is by far the most expensive part of the system, and even then, it's still not going to get you the really deep pressures that make sputtering other materials easier. For that, you're going to need something like a secondary diffusion pump after the normal vacuum pump, which, while I do have one, I didn't want to bother hooking it up to this prototype setup. And for those wondering, no, there's not a vacuum gauge on this particular system, it's in the mail and will be added later. Moving on, let's talk about the magnet section. First, for the magnets themselves, we'll use a pair of magnets, one ring, and a cylinder that fits into the middle. Here I'm using two stacked 1-inch rings and a single cylinder, so it's all the same height. Not for any particular reason, other than those were the ones that I found when I ordered these years ago. They need to be held apart so that the cylinder is actually in the middle, so I made a small spacer out of Delrin, which could tightly fit around the inner magnet and into the outer magnet. I chose these kind of randomly, but by varying the size of each magnet, you'll change the exact shape and size of the plasma ring that forms. Mine formed a small 1cm or so ring, but normally you choose magnets that give you a larger ring. The idea here is that the inner magnet is pointing in the opposite direction to the ring magnet, so the field coming out of one curves and flows directly into the other. This makes this sort of M-shaped field, where you end up with this kind of dead zone as the field lines approach perpendicular to the magnet they're coming out of. The plasma is pushed and pulled by the magnetic field, but in the dead zone it can all concentrate, and is then held in place by the surrounding field. So you get this donut of concentrated plasma that's right in contact with the metal or material you want to sputter. We also add a small disc of steel to the bottom of the magnets to make this effect more pronounced and get a stronger field out the front. Plasma is just a mixture of gas atoms that have been ionized by electrons bumping into them that come spewing out of the different electrodes. Once the atoms are ionized and charged, they too can be pushed around by electric and magnetic fields. Temperature is really just a measure of average motion of particles, so in that hot ring of plasma, the glowing argon atoms are flying around at high speeds. They have a similar mass to copper, so sometimes, when they slam into the copper surface, they knock some of the copper atoms free. 
Think of this sort of like a Newton's cradle. The kinetic energy is transferred to the copper atoms, sending it flying upwards at whatever you want to coat. Once there's copper atoms in the plasma, they too can slam into more copper, and since their mass is identical, they're even better at knocking more copper free. Once the copper atoms crash into something solid, they can give up all that energy and stay put, coating the material in a growing layer of copper the longer this goes on. After a few runs, my chamber was covered in a dark layer of copper metal, which I'd occasionally clean off so I could still see what was going on. An obvious consequence of this is that things are going to get really hot. So to prevent everything getting fried, which is what killed many of my earlier attempts, we need to build a cooling chamber for the magnets. What I ended up going with isn't really ideal, but did a good job and was sufficient for the prototype. It's just two pieces of 2mm aluminum bar stock, and a piece of plastic which I cut a rectangular hole out of. One of the pieces of aluminum had a hole bored into it to fit the magnets. To connect the water to the cooling chamber, I made two hose connectors out of some acrylic tubing, and drilled two holes in the plastic to fit them. These were epoxied into place, and the bottom aluminum plate was epoxied as well. To hold the magnets themselves in place, I used high temperature silicone gasket sealant. I also used a bit of painter's tape to make a little ledge around the magnets, so that the silicone would have a mold to cure in without dripping. Once I was happy with the coverage and that I didn't have any gaps or holes, I spent some time cleaning off the excess with swabs and a paper towel. Then it was left to cure overnight. The next day, once it was cured, I mixed up some fresh epoxy, but not to glue the chamber shut. I knew that as I'd been handling the magnets, they'd probably gotten a bit scratched, and water will destroy the magnets if it gets through their coating. Also, that steel disc under the magnets isn't stainless, so I coated everything in a thin layer of epoxy to insulate them from the water and to prevent damage, but not so thick that it impeded removal of heat from the magnet assembly. Once that was dry, the magnet chamber could then actually be epoxied shut. My water pump and coolant unit I'll save for a follow-up to the Rotovap video, but it's just some water pumps, a bucket, and some ice water. Nothing overly exciting for this use, though it does have a little built-in tiny vacuum pump for doing filtrations in the lab. The last piece is something we can rest our samples on, which can take the abuse of being in plasma. I went with some scrap stainless steel and cut, folded, and drilled it to make a little rectangular carriage. This was suspended in the chamber using some wire wrapped around that groove we added to the feed-through earlier. Finally, let's talk electrical. To generate my high voltage, I'm using a microwave oven transformer. This is by far the most dangerous part of the whole system and will hurt the entire time you're dying if you touch it while it's running. So the utmost care needs to be exercised around the high voltage wires, anything connected to them, and the transformer itself. It puts out a high voltage, high current AC, around 2 kilovolts, but we need DC for this to work properly. So to convert between them, I'll be using a <clears throat> FULL BRIDGE RECTIFIER! I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. The rectifier is made out of four microwave oven diodes arranged like so. You connect the AC input here and here, and get a positive and negative DC output. To control the system, I'm using a Variac, which is a special transformer that lets you throttle the voltage from 0 to 120 volts on the input side of the transformer. For my runs, I never went past 60 volts, as any more and so much current would be drawn that the diodes would probably explode. And with that, all of our pieces are basically ready to go. Before we fire things up, the copper plate was sanded with a 600 grit or higher sandpaper to remove any oxides or contamination, and then it's all cleaned well with acetone. The gasket is also cleaned with acetone and then placed onto the plate. The chamber is also cleaned with acetone, as is a microscope slide which is then loaded onto the carriage. After that, you just place the chamber onto the plate. The way I like to start this is by flowing some argon through the system for a minute or two to flush everything out before I turn on the vacuum. Then I'll hit the vacuum while the argon is still running, and then after a moment, turn off the argon so that the system can pump down. After a minute or two, I'll let another puff of argon into the now mostly empty chamber before letting it pump down again. I repeat this twice to make sure that there's as little oxygen or water contamination from the air left in the chamber as physically possible. At this point, I'll step away and leave everything to pump down for at least half an hour so that the remaining water is removed. Now comes the fun part. The negative is connected to the copper, and the positive is connected to the feed-through at the top. When you turn on the voltage and bring the Variac up to about 20 volts, you start to get some plasma. I only turn it on for a moment though, as the goal is to line up the magnet assembly underneath, so that none of the plasma is touching the gasket and is centered in the chamber. So being extremely careful to remember to turn the power off between adjustments, turn on the plasma, check the location, turn it off, and then make some adjustments to the position. Once you're happy with the alignment, we can bring it up to power and start the sputtering process. What I found worked best was to bring the voltage up pretty high, around 50 volts. 
This gets the copper nice and hot, and you'll quickly see the plasma change color to the beautiful green that indicates copper ions are floating around. At this point, I bring it way down to 35 volts and let the copper slowly be sprayed up at the thing I'm coating. After a moment, once you see that green plasma, you'll start to see the glass get darker. In the opening segment, I sped up the deposition a lot, and in reality, it takes 4-8 to eight minutes to get a full mirror depending on how hot you're running things. But keep in mind that getting things too hot and the carriage itself will start to release metal vapor, which will contaminate your sample. You can see this as a greenish border on some of my samples, or a kind of weird burn spot. It's hard to explain just how excited I was when I got my first thin layer of copper to work. I literally danced around the room for, frankly, an embarrassing amount of time. And on top of it all, I got to see that beautiful glow of copper plasma, which really isn't something you get to see very often. In theory, if you do other metals, you can get other colors, but most metals just kind of look white for the most part. Sure, you could do lithium or strontium to get a red plasma, I just don't know why you would want to do that. Depending on how long you let the deposition go for, you can get different thicknesses of copper and also different amounts of mirror. If you only let it sputter for a short time, you can very easily make what's called a half-silver mirror, which is what we used a few weeks ago to make this little interferometer setup. The half mirror lets some light through while reflecting some, which is used to split a single laser beam into two beams. This is also used in things like holography and many other optical setups. Speaking of optics, another use for sputtering is making the special filters that we've used in many previous videos. As we talked about in the last video, dichroic mirrors are made by coating glass in a thin layer of metal oxide or other ceramic. This makes something called thin film interference happen, which is the same effect that makes bubbles and oil spills iridescent. For a full explanation, watch my last video, link in the description. During one of my earlier runs, I hadn't been bothering to clean the copper surface between tests, so a layer of oxide had slowly been building up. When I went to do my next sputtering run, I noticed that something looked kind of weird, almost like a burn spot. What was happening was that rather than coating the glass in copper, it was now coating it in copper oxide. When I took the sample out, it was perfectly clear, but now it was a yellow color, and the borders around the burn were rainbowy, though this was really hard to capture on camera. The reflection was also distinctly blue. So what had happened was by accident I had made some sort of dichroic mirror. In the eventual follow-up video, we'll be exploring this in much more detail and purposely making metal oxide coatings and dichroic mirrors. In theory, I'll be able to make all sorts of fancy filters myself now, which will hopefully mean all sorts of cool optical experiments. Beyond that, I want to try patterning or etching the copper layers, and of course, revisiting this to get other metals to work as well. And finally, I want to try and do carbon coatings with this system. In theory, you can replace the copper with graphite and coat things in a layer of diamond-like carbon, but I suspect getting that to work is going to be very difficult. Either way, this project has been a very long time in the making, and I'm so glad to finally have this much success. For the immediate future, I think I'm going to let this project rest for a little while, but we'll be back to it to put it to use in lots of future videos. I'm sure this was a lot of information, so if you made it this far, thanks for sticking around, and I hope you enjoyed. This is the part of the video where I need to say a huge thank you to my many patrons, channel members, and supporters on Ko-fi that make these videos possible. This project is one of the hardest ones I've attempted lately, and it's your amazing support that gives me the time to tackle hard problems like this. So thanks for your continued support, and if you'd like to help me keep the flow of science videos coming, then consider kicking a buck or two my way. As always, be sure to subscribe and ring that bell to see when I post new videos. And if you've got ideas for things you want to see coded, or other materials or processes you want me to try, leave them in the comments. To see these projects and more long before they make it into videos, be sure to head over to my other social media pages. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.